Welcome to the Awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn, and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward, and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote, where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson, and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listings photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. You are listening to episode number 45 of the Awesomers.com podcast. And as the secret has finally been revealed, all you have to do is go to awesomers.com slash 45 to get all the relevant show notes and details. And that includes even sometimes links that we promise to put on there. Sometimes we actually do that. Today, my special guest is Andy Slammons. And his adventures on Amazon started while he was working full time as a house parent caring for and living with 12 at-risk high school boys. And we dive into that a little bit today. It's very, very interesting story how Andy kind of came into this uh, line of work and, and his journey so far. Andy knew it was time to leave his full-time job when his home looked like a prep and pack warehouse from all the inventory that was moving through it on a daily basis. And for any of us who've uh, run e-commerce businesses or even Amazon-based businesses, there's probably been one time or another where that living room, dining room is full of boxes and you're packing and picking stuff. It's a crazy, crazy environment for sure. Andy has launched over 100 products on Amazon, is now focusing on two multi-million dollar brands he's growing the right way on Amazon. Andy is a partner in Amazing Freedom, which is a company dedicated to helping e-commerce sellers and brands win on the Amazon.com selling platform. Andy's a true giver and somebody who really cares about his fellow man and his fellow entrepreneurs for that matter. And it's something that I think that, you know, all of us can learn from is, you know, how can we make a a big impact on other people's lives? And Andy certainly personifies that and lives up to that in every possible way. Hey, Awesomers. Uh, Here I am, Steve Simons, and I'm back again with another episode of the Awesomers.com podcast. And today we're lucky because we are joined by a very special guest, Andy Slavins. Is that correct pronunciation? That is, just like slamming a basketball. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, I've really, I've had quite a run uh, today, and so the the audience, which probably lost confidence in my ability to pronounce people's names for a while, may be slowly building their confidence again, uh, (laughs) only to be dashed in a future episode, no doubt. So uh, (laughs) welcome again, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, as I like to begin now, I've already read kind of a bio and an introduction uh, for the audience to hear kind of uh, your summary, but I always like to hear from you firsthand in your own words, kind of what, what, what do you do day to day? What takes your time? What are you investing in day to day? Sure, absolutely. So I have two primary uh, businesses right now. Uh, one is I sell physical products on Amazon, uh, probably like uh, a number of the listeners to your podcast do, uh, as well as I'm a partner uh, in an agency called Amazing Freedom. Uh, and in that agency, we offer a number of services uh, helping Amazon sellers like listing creation, PPC management, and, and Amazon account management. Yeah, there's a lot of details that go into running any e-commerce business, but the Amazon niche itself has its own little uh, variation of, uh, as you said, listing management. Uh, my understanding is you guys deal with images and some of the other uh, normal things that uh, entrepreneurs have to deal with and solve. Yeah, so it's interesting. All of our services were kind of born out of our own personal pain points. I'm sure you've experienced that, right, as your business has grown. Um, You know, as you grow, time becomes more valuable. And so you're willing to pay for services that are good um, and that can save you that time, right? Which a lot of, like, when our business was growing, we were getting bottlenecked. And uh, we got tired of using Fiverr. Uh, we joke about Fiverr actually becomes like 30 Fiverr by the time you end up paying for, you know, the things that you look for. And, it, and a lot of times it can be painful trying to find the right person on Fiverr. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, it, for sure that the uh, necessity is a mother of invention, as they say, right? So <laughs> number one, it's like, I don't know how to do it. Uh, my very first business, we started programming the computer simply because there wasn't an alternative. We had to build our own platform. <laughs> and uh, what a nightmare that was. Uh, yet, again, completely necessary. We had no alternatives at that time. And, and it is quite um, interesting, and I think a, a salient point to say that Fiverr is no longer Fiverr. <laughs> that just happens to be a, a fun little marketing name. It used to be you get stuff done for five bucks. And, uh, the, gone are those days because if you have the audacity to expect a commercial uh, license to use whatever graphic they made for you, then that's another 50 bucks. And uh, they right. just seem to be on a, a, just a, a real kill streak when it comes to uh, the joy <laughs> of that place. Have yeah, you think that, the same thing? I think that's the platform. It's the king of the upsell. <laughs> yeah, man, oh man, it is. Uh, now I will say uh, a pro tip out there: if you're still needing to find gigs or and you happen to use Fiverr, is if you email the person ahead of time, you ask them for a quote, and you make sure that you um, talk about your requirements ahead of time. You're far more likely to get what you want as opposed to just kind of clicking the buttons. If you go through and click on all of those little upsells, you know you could get a a, a, a tiny little Facebook ad graphic costs you ninety five dollars. And, you know, not, not 12 months ago, you could get one of those or, or five of those knocked down for five or $10. So <laughs> right. it's gone uh, crazy. So kudos to them. They're making money. The uh, <laughs> freelancers are thrilled. But the pro tip is if you go to them and say, here's what I need, here's my price, and I expect all the commercial IP releases, whatever it is, uh, most often they'll give it to you. Yep. Uh, but like you, I found, uh, I think my ratio is about 30% uh, fail rate on Fiverr, just yes. right off the top. Yes. So we've, we've done whatever dance. Uh, I placed the gig and 30% <laughs> of the time it just fails. And this is a big Fiverr defect for those Fiverr fans and perhaps the Fiverr management team listening. The inability to leave a review on somebody who you had to fire because they sucked and never responded <laughs> is an absolute giant gap. What do you think, Andy? Am I yeah, right or wrong? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's what it ends up being. It ends up being a time suck. You spend three or four days trying to get something done, and then you end up with nothing. And sometimes it can just be frustrating experience. Yeah, I got a review for you on that right here, Fiber. It sucks. Uh, <laughs> zero stars for that. Uh, fix it or uh, find uh, our, our, us taking our business elsewhere. All, All right, right. So, Andy, I, I'm thrilled that you're joining me. I always. Uh, I think the last time I saw you, we were hanging out in Orlando, uh, maybe at yes. Celicon. Yeah, that's right. And we had a fun conversation. We always do. And so uh, we're going to come right back after this, though. We're going to dive into your origin story. And uh, I really like to get into where people come from. So we're going to do that right after this break. Hey, Amazon Marketplace professionals, congratulations on your success to date. Your creativity, strategic vision, problem solving, and discipline have allowed you to build your own e-commerce business. Wouldn't it be great if you had more time to focus on the things that truly drive the sales and growth of your company? Instead of getting lost in a dozen different services and countless spreadsheets, what if there was one system that connected to your Amazon account and automatically gave you the information that you needed to make great decisions and really impact your business? Parsimony ERP can do that. Parsimony is the business operating system for your marketplace business. With Parsimony, you get true double entry bookkeeping, easy financial statements, full customer service tools, and item by item profitability, along with project and task management, and more features are being added all the time. Learn more at parsimony.com. That's parsimony, P A R S I M O N Y.com. Parsimony.com. We've got that. Hey, guess what? We're back. And uh, we're going to talk to Andy about his beginnings. And the very beginning of the beginning is where you were born. Yeah, sure. So I'm originally from Aurora, Illinois, which happens to be the home of Wayne's World. Uh, you're probably old enough to remember that movie. First of uh, all, how dare you? And yes, I know it well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm a diehard Cubs fan. So Aurora is about 40 miles west of Chicago. Um, and you know, one of my, uh, um, things that I did when I was growing up is I would take the train, uh, into Chicago, uh, and, uh, go watch the Cubs at Wrigley field. So it's a different time. Now, I don't know if I would let my, uh, seventh grade or my eighth grade son take a train into Philadelphia. We're about two hours away, but, uh, but my parents did, I would go in there and from seventh and eighth grade, take the train. And at the time in Wrigley, you could actually wait in line and sit in the bleachers and there's no assigned seating. So, uh, you know, this is the time when Andre Dawson played for him, Ryan Sandberg, 
uh, Rick Sutcliffe, if you're a baseball fan at all, you remember those guys. And so we would always go before batting practice, and without fail, we would get a, a baseball because you know how easy it is oh, to knock yeah. it out. And we always sit in left field. So, yeah, I'm a diehard Cubs fan, born in Royal Illinois. Well, that's uh, fascinating to me. Now, I'm not uh, a, a huge baseball expert. Uh, uh, what's the, what was the win uh, streak like that? Was there a lot of uh, uh, World Series rings at the time? <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I wish. Digress. I, I digress. Wish. <laughs> <laughs> I did know that one little piece of trivia. Uh, so I, I do love that fact. And so you, you started out there. Now, how about your parents? What, what kind of work were they involved in? when you came into this world? Sure, so my father, uh, Blue Collar, worked for the Burlington Northern Railroad. Uh, started out, um, I don't know what his first job was, but he ended up being like a ticket agent. So he would work, um, you know, basically selling tickets at, uh, in a suburb uh, for folks driving in Chicago. Mom stayed home mom, great family. They're still together to get today. I think they've been married for 58 or 59 years now. All right, wow, that's a, a rare accomplishment. Kudos to them. Yeah. And so uh, that's a very interesting uh, background. And I always like to kind of throw it in and, and then learn about the siblings. How about any brothers or sisters? Yeah, so I'm actually the youngest. Uh, there's four boys in our family. I have three older brothers. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I was kind of the one that was always left out. But, uh, but that's all right. I'm actually the tallest, the biggest. And, uh, and I think I can handle all of them now. Couldn't oh, buy. I love it. <laughs> uh, I love it when the youngest one starts talking trash. That's uh, <laughs> the older guys are like, yeah, we've seen more than you know, boy. <laughs> yeah, I'm the oldest of a brood of nine. So I, I oh, get, nice. Uh, now tell me this. Uh, are any of your siblings uh, entrepreneurial in nature? Have they uh, fought, found their path similar to you or how's that working out? Yeah. So interesting enough, uh, I have two brothers that are, they, they both own their own businesses. Uh, they, and they own them basically almost out of high school. Then I have another brother who is a VP for a Fortune 500 company. Uh, the, the three uh, guys, we, we make fun of him because as far as we can tell, he plays golf and he entertains for, for a living. That's why they call it the Fortune 500. <laughs> that's right. 500. Uh, yeah, that's golf clubs and uh, caddies. Uh, I love it. So uh, it's a very interesting thing. Do you have any uh, speculation as to you know, why 75% of your uh, – the, the family there ended up in an entrepreneurial bend? You know, I really do think it had to do with the security of, of my family. Again, my parents, just great parents. Uh, and uh, they had a great relationship, very structured. Uh, you know, I think they did a really good job raising us. And I think my, um, my, my two brothers that are entrepreneurs that own their own business, they had the security. You know, when you, when you have a springboard and a, a strong foundation like that, um, it's a lot easier to take swings, I think. Uh, and so, you know, both of them were, were willing to take the risk and, uh, and they had that strong foundation to do that. Yes, I appreciate the baseball metaphor. Uh, for our uh, out of town guests, uh, you could also think of it as a cricket swing. Uh, that, I yeah, think go. that still works. Uh, <laughs> so how about university? Did you uh, attend university after uh, high school or how'd that go? Yes, I did actually. Um, went, went to university. Uh, you know, interesting going back to, to uh, origin family uh, issues. So my bent growing up was like to help people, right? And, and this is probably, it sounds a little weird. Um, and I can remember actually sitting down at the dinner table with my family and my three brothers who were all older and my father, they would always talk business, right? And I can remember hating that. It just wasn't my nature. I was a social work major in college. Wow. And so, that's quite a, quite a change. Yeah, and so it was, there was like no connection there because I didn't understand, you know, why they always wanted to talk about business. They're talking about ROIs. They're talking about margin. Um, and so I really wanted nothing to do with that. Went to college, got a social work degree. I will say this. My most important certificate that I got in college was my marriage certificate. <laughs> All right. Well done. And, uh, and so, yeah, that was, it's interesting that I ended up in business and maybe we'll get a little bit into that. Um, but growing up, I wanted nothing to do with business. All I wanted to do was, was to help people. I don't know if I had a little bit of, you know, a hippie in me, um, and, and just kind of want to stay away from the corporate. But now that I've been in business, I see more and more that it's about relationships. <laughs> For sure, so, yeah. You know, I think if I would have understood that a little sooner, I probably would have jumped in business um, a lot faster. Well, and it's, it's a 
maybe counterintuitive, especially to the young or to those uninitiated, but the amount of help you can do as an entrepreneur is significant, right? It's far reaching. It's wide impacting the, the program that you guys operate, helping people get into the private label business. This is, this is having a massive effect. I think probably far more effective than any government organization I can imagine. What Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, I definitely think that's a really good, so it's, it is fun, you know, as we grow and mature to kind of uh, see our thoughts and our, our philosophies evolve. Uh, and I appreciate you sharing that uh, detail. Uh, how about at a university? What was the first job? Uh, what, what did you decide to tackle as you came out of uh, school? Yeah, so um, I was, uh, like I said, I was a social work major. So I actually worked at a church uh, working with kids in the inner city of North Philadelphia, uh, a real tough area there. Uh, and again, basically, I was, you know, building relationships with kids who were kind of throwaway kids, right? Uh, kids that society doesn't necessarily think about or want to deal with. So that's what I did. I did that for two or three years. My wife and I found that um, the greatest impact that we were having on kids were the ones who would come over to our house. And so, you know, we would meet them um, at the church. We would hang out with them. We would take them to events. But the ones who were really interested in us would often come over to our house. And we saw that those who came to our house, we were having a much deeper impact with them. So we thought, well, you know what, why don't we, can we find a job where we take care of kids, almost like adopt kids, right, and raise them for our own home? Uh, and so we did that. <laughs> we, uh, we left that position where I was at, and then for 15 years, we lived with 12 high school boys, and we basically raised them like, uh, like they were our own kids. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, you know, my, my, the full extent of my knowledge of North Philadelphia is from the uh, Will Smith uh, Fresh Prince. Uh, <laughs> right. So it's, it's limited, I, I would say. But how was that? First of all, living with 12 boys on its own seems insane. But uh, right. high school boys with the hormones raging and, and you know, uh, all, all the various things that go along with that. How was that experience for you guys? Obviously, you did it for a great deal of time. You must have loved it. But it seems yeah, like I a mean, nutty thing. Yeah, you know, it's almost like coaching. So, you know, you have to earn the respect, right, of the kids. Uh, and, uh, but once you earn their respect, and we like to lead out of relationship. And so, you know, some people, they lead out of rules. I would say that's kind of more fear-based leadership. Uh, we uh, like to lead out of relationship. So we would, you know, we would show them respect in all ways um, and, and really try to bring them along from, from their understanding that we really cared about them. And, uh, and that's how it worked. And, uh, and it was a good, good gig. We enjoyed it uh, and did it for 15 years. So how did that work? Um, you mentioned they were in high school age. Uh, so did, did they just kind of keep cycling through or how, how was that uh, functionally yes. working? Yeah, so it's an amazing place we worked at. It's called Milton Hershey School. It was actually started by the, the founder of the Hershey, Hershey. Chocolate Company. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when he actually 45 years before he passed away, he donated his entire fortune. This is like in the 1930s, which at the time was, I believe it was $50 million uh, that he donated to the school. And the school now, the trust is between 13 and 14 billion. That's with a B. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's probably one of the top 30 educational trusts in the world. And uh, they have over 2000 students. All the students have to be below a certain financial level. And uh, it's just an amazing place. There's no other place like it in the entire world. It's the largest uh, pre-K through 12 residential educational school in the world. Uh, and it's hidden. Like nobody knows about it. And, and they work with some of the neediest kids, you know, that, that you and I could imagine. Yeah, that is uh, really extraordinary. I have heard of Hershey, Pennsylvania, and know some of the, the Hershey story to some extent, but I, I didn't remember the school aspect and, and how they turned a $50 million fortune into multi-billions. That's uh, an investment course in its own. I suppose there's probably some, some uh, uh, graduates who've come back and put some more money into the, the coffers as well, but man, oh man, what an accomplishment. Yeah, it really is. It's an amazing place, and they've done a really good job. He had some terrific lawyers who wrote up a deed of trust that really protected that money and helped it grow. Yeah, that's a, a very good lesson for us all as we think about our exit and we think about whether it's, you know, a, a family trust or family foundation or how, how you're going to, uh, you know, kind of uh, make a, a mark on the world. I think it's a, a good example to learn from. So, so after that job, and you did that for quite a number of years, wh where did you go from there? 
Yeah. So, you know, I started selling on Amazon part-time just as a way to kind of get my mind off of the day-to-day dealings uh, that I was going through with, with some of the students in my house. So as you can imagine, the house parents, similar to being a teacher, you know, some years are awesome. Some years can be really challenging, you know, depending on the personalities you have in your class. Uh, and so I started selling on Amazon part-time and uh, this was 2013, 2014. And man, the sales just like took off. And so, you know, I was doing what's called retail arbitrage. You would go to thrift stores, you would go to big box stores and, uh, and basically resell things you purchased there on discount and did that for a year. I believe the first year I hit like 130,000, very part time. And I was like, man, I either have to scale down my Amazon business um, or you know, my wife and I had to think about changing professions. So, so that's what we did. You know, we, we thought about it. We've done it for 15 years and, uh, and I was having such fun. I mean, you know, you sell on Amazon. It's a blast to check your account. You know, sometimes that's a great thing about selling on Amazon. Sometimes I won't do anything for two or three days yet. You know, my account is still humming away because of the FBA program. Um, and so, you know, I thought, man, you know, if there's any time that I'm going to move or do something different, sounds like a great opportunity now. Well, this is, this is one of those things. So for those who are listening who may not know FBA, that's a fulfillment by Amazon. This is where Amazon actually opens their warehouse to just anybody, marketplace sellers. Uh, it could be any of us. And we put our stuff in there. And then when they get an order for it on Amazon, they just automatically ship it out. And they deal with all the logistics and shipping and all that stuff. And of course, there's fees that go along with that. And the fees increase uh, almost by the hour. But the, the convenience and the scalability and the flexibility and all those things that go with it, this is where I always try to give Amazon high amounts of credit and, and recognition for the stuff they do really well so that the other times when I have to beat them down for things that they're not doing as well, that I am a fair guy. Uh, but this is, you know, this platform of FBA has launched so many entrepreneurs and it sounds like that was where you started making your leverage play. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it was, it almost, it, it felt like it was too good to be true. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I had sold on eBay a little bit and it was kind of painful because, you know, you're dealing with the customers, although that's changing a little bit. I, I've actually upped my eBay uh, sales uh, in the last year, but I didn't want to really deal with that. And really the, the FBA program, it almost felt too good to be true. It almost still feels too good to be true. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think there's actually a fair number of sellers, especially when you start achieving certain levels of metrics. Um, and everybody can pick their own metric of success. You know, whether that's 5,000 a month, 50,000 a month, 500,000 a month, or 5 million a month, doesn't matter. There, there's a point where you're like, uh, is this thing real? Uh, you know, <laughs> what, what happens when the lights go on and, and all the sales disappear? You know, everybody's kind of nervous about that. Have you ever been nervous along that line? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think fear is definitely a part of, of what drives you in whatever you do. And, uh, and so there is a, a little bit of fear there. But again, I've been doing it now for almost five years. And I've never had any issues. Amazon's always been good to me. Uh, but I, I always, you know, I try to sell good products that, that meet customer needs. And, uh, and then I bend over backwards in customer service for Amazon customers. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that Amazon deserves a lot of credit for. Um, their, their policies and their, their requirements for customer service can be considered quite rigid in one respect, but from the consumer perspective, we're all like, oh, just buy it from Amazon. We know we can just return if it's a problem, right? And yeah. the reality is that flexibility, that comfort by, on the behalf of the customer is what drives so much business. That's what drives the confidence. That's what makes the marketplace so successful, honestly. And so all of us had to raise our game, right? There's no point in shipping out bad quality product because they're going to send it back to you. And then they're going to leave bad reviews and they're going to complain. And it, you just skip all that work by doing something of actual value. And it sounds like you learned that lesson early on. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's something that, that we coach and something that we often teach on to, to folks that we work with is you need to take the platform seriously and, uh, and you need to, you know, treat the customer like it's, it was you buying a product. And so, you know, I, I definitely refund very liberally. Thankfully, uh, you know, my, my overall refund rate stays still between three and 5%. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, if there's any issue at all with customers, when they reach out to me, I correct it and I make it right. 
And, uh, and hopefully, you know, we continue to get that message out as well to, to folks that sell on Amazon because that just builds trust and it just grows the platform. Yeah, and I think really this is a philosophy that anybody paying attention, uh, all of you executives at eBay or Newegg or Jet or Walmart or whoever, you know, you have to hold the, the standards of the marketplace sellers very high because that's what builds the customer confidence. And of all of us, our own e-commerce sites, whatever the channel is, if we don't treat the customer like we want them to come back, why would they come back? And it sounds so basic, but I, I really do think that people often think about the customer as an afterthought, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, I did all this work, all this sourcing and logistics, and the customer is just the end of the thing where I get paid. And it's like, no, that's the beginning of the relationship. That's where your brand begins. The rest mm -hmm. of the stuff was just the ante to the game. Is, is that how you kind of feel about it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and customers are a gold mine for you too. And that's why, you know, reviews on Amazon uh, for your brand are, are so critical. Uh, that, number one, that you read them, you listen to them. Uh, you know, for me, I, I make modifications. I've made modifications on my products from that feedback from the customers. Uh, I've had a number of phone calls with customers, you know, and, and I always try to turn a bad customer into a good customer. Uh, you know, and so I'll actually reach out on the phone if they're willing to talk and, you know, try to talk through issues, but also try to hear them. Uh, and, and I think that in the long run is, is what makes your brand valuable. Yeah, I think that's a very good uh, and salient point to, to drive home to the customers out there listening that every, cus every company is going to have some sort of issue. You're going you're gonna to make a mistake at some point. The measure of a company is how you deal with it. That, that's how you should be judged. Not the fact that you made a mistake or something happened that wasn't uh, as planned or, you know, it didn't have the perfect consumer experience. It's what you do to make it right. And, you know, Andy's already talked about the fact that, you know, liberal refunds, right? It, it, this is not about a one-time sale. This is about a long-term relationship. And that's what makes a brand successful. That's what builds equity in a brand. I, I salute you for, for not just doing that and executing that yourself, but also teaching that to others. Yep. Very good job. Uh, so let me ask you this. Uh, along this journey, you know, from uh, over all low these many years, uh, dare I say it, um, w is there a defining moment that kind of sticks out in your mind that kind of puts you, you know, on the road of success or where, where you think of yourself today? Yeah, so, I mean, we talked about it a little earlier. Uh, I think the real aha moment for me was when I discovered that uh, business is really about relationships. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I never really had that paradigm uh, until I started selling on Amazon, until I started going to conferences, until I started meeting people. And, and I realized that people want to do business with people they trust, uh, business with people they like. And, uh, and I thought, well, man, you know what? I, I've been pretty good my entire life at building relationships. <laughs> sure. You know, I haven't been good at a lot of things, but I have been good at building relationships. And so, you know, trying to be authentic, trying to be transparent, trying to uh, treat people uh, fairly, right? And, 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 and man, that has helped me in my Amazon business as well as our agency, I think more than any other principal. Is, uh, is really just trying to give value to people uh, with no expectations of getting anything back. Uh, and time and time again, um, new opportunities have popped up uh, just, just by really, um, you know, digging in, just, you know, getting to know people, shaking hands, and, and really just being friendly. I know it probably sounds a little corny, <laughs> but I can tell you it's been absolutely true for me over the last five years. It's been relationships that I've been able to get in with folks that have really helped my business grow. It's definitely not corny to me. And in fact, it, it reminds me, um, of course, I already said it at the top of the show, but it, it always deserves uh, reinforcement of this principle that Zig Ziglar painted the picture very well with this quote that I'm, I'm sure I'll butcher in some way. But he, he essentially says, you can have everything you want in your life if you help enough other people get what they want in their life. Oh, that's good. And, it's, it's something that, you know, I, I try to live up to that principle, that ideal, because there, you really do get a lot out of helping other people. They get, you know, some benefit a, along the way. And these relationships and these conferences and all of this networking that happens, there, it, it just kind of creates its own flywheel effect. And it just keeps chugging along and chugging along. And after you've been doing it a long time, like me and maybe uh, like you, th there's just so many things that just fall out of that flywheel 
kind of dynamically. You, you never expect it, but here it is. Have yeah, you had absolutely. any little surprises come out? Uh, well, you know, I, I often say I, I have a partner. His name is Leron Hirschkorn. And, uh, you know, I just met him at a conference and, you know, started to get to know him. And, you know, like I shared, he's a partner with me in, in our agency and just phenomenal um, Amazon seller. Uh, you know, he, I think, has like the it factor. And so, you know, that partnership was born really just kind of out of getting to know each other a little bit on Facebook and then meeting at a conference. Um, and uh, we've become great friends and, uh, and we're enjoying life and just having a great time uh, doing Amazon. Uh, that's a, a really terrific uh, example of the, you know, the going to conferences and networking and, and, you know, including being friendly and kind of paying it forward. This, this is often an intangible asset. Right. You, as I often say, you don't come back from a conference and look at your bank account and it's tripled. Right. There, that, that's not the exact tangible result you should expect, but it can have a compounding relationship equity effect. And I, I really appreciate that. Uh, how about a big lesson? Is there anything that that, sh you know, is really shiny to you that go, you know, along my journey? Here's a lesson that I, you know, I wish I knew earlier or that I feel it's I feel compelled to impart to awesomers out there. Sure. So. You know, I shared a little earlier, I was very hesitant toward, toward uh, anything related to business because I really didn't think I had the skill set, you know, when I was growing up. I saw my brothers, they were all good. It just wasn't my bent. Uh, and so uh, I didn't get into it, you know, again, until five years ago. And I think a lot of that was fear. Uh, and, you know, when I did step into it full time uh, four and a half years ago, the quote that always sticks with me is the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. Uh, Johnny and so, Walker fan right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was working in a very comfortable position. Uh, you know, I had a decent salary, had really good health benefits, but I wasn't really growing individually or growing professionally. And I think I stayed in that position more out of fear of the unknown, um, you know, rather than kind of going out and, you know, having a entrepreneurial spirit or kind of a conquering uh, attitude. And so, you know, taking that first step uh, and now has kind of led me where, where I am today. Uh, and, and I would never like taking that step four years ago, I would have never thought I could kind of where, where I am today. Uh, but, um, but it started with that first step. And so at the end of the day, I just had to overcome my fear, right? And, and take that step. Well, I think that's a, a very uh, a nice lesson learned, number one. And, you know, of course, you're not alone. This is, this is the most obvious obstacle to people is that they, they don't know what's going to happen, that fear of the unknown. And, and you know what? It's easier just to kind of backtrack into the comfort zone. And that's fine. I, I get it. That's, the, that's our wiring where, you know, our, our lizard part of the brain goes, no, no, get back in the cave. Everything's safe in the cave. Nobody go outside the cave. Um, but we, we realize that, you know, if we're going to reach a potential that is beyond normal, you know, something that, like I say, we want to be awesome or we want to get, you know, past that, whatever adequate is, it, it's not adequate to us, right? Yeah. Uh, adequatulence is not acceptable in my world. And so that means we have to push ourselves and even fail. And I, I would ask you, you know, it sounds like you, you got a hit and you got going early on. Have you ever had any, uh, little, uh, you know, problems along the way? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? We all have, if you've been in business any amount of time, you're going to hit some potholes. Uh, you know, one of mine early on, one of my first products that I brought to Amazon, uh, I had to, um, you know, give away through promo codes that Amazon provides. And, uh, and I did that. I set up the uh, promo code, <laughs> set up the promo code wrong in my entire inventory. So I set it up like at 12 o'clock at night. I'd done it before, I knew what to do, but it was too late, I shouldn't have. And back then it was kind of like, it was weird. You had to like uncheck this little box that was hidden um, and uh, set it up. 4 a.m., like I wake up with this terrifying fear. You know, like, did I uncheck that box or did I leave it checked? So I reach my, for my phone, you know, by the bedside, go into my Amazon account, and all thousand units were wiped out. So it ended up being about a $13,000 loss. Now you gotta understand, I had just left my secure full-time job, you know, with full health benefits. And it was like I'd flushed $13,000 down the toilet. 
So needless to say, I was physically sick. I was like dry heaving, you know, over the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh, but I was all in there at some level. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, for, for a brief moment, I was like, man, did I make the right step? But I was all in at that point. So, um, you know, so that that didn't deter me. There were so many examples, and th this has uh, largely been resolved at this stage uh, through education and, and better feature set, but there was a, a way that, as Andy described, of setting up a coupon. It's like, hey, I want to give this coupon, and you had to uncheck to, like, I don't want to show this to everybody, but <laughs> if it showed to everybody or made it available to everybody, then that thing could go viral, and all your stuff went away at 99% off or whatever the deal was, and that <laughs> is just like the most gut-wrenching thing. We had a, a, a case very similar to that, and by the way, I think we burned... 25 grand in uh, a, a few hours. And one of our coupons we had set up, the, the coupon stack they set up, all compounded, they could use them all together. So they're buying, you know, thousand dollars worth of stuff at a shot and we kind of owe them money at the end of the deal. Right, right. It's like, so I have to ship them free stuff and write a check. This is terrible. So luckily we were able to put a, a, a stop to about, um, about 70% of it before it shipped. And, uh, but man, oh man, we've all made those mistakes and they're, they're never awesome. That's for sure. <laughs> so I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, how about, you know, whether it's the entrepreneurial journey or, or, uh, your life before, was there ever a time you just kind of wanted to give up and, and do something different, just change gears altogether? Um, you know, so I, when I was in the job that I was at for, for 15 years, uh, uh, Toward the end of that time, I definitely was feeling uh, a little bit, um, I'm trying to think of the word, a little bit stymied, I guess, maybe from middle management. So it's a large organization. And like any organization, you have middle managers. And it seems like that's always the pain point. You know, for folks that are on the front line, they're always, you know, they're dealing with the middle managers. You got the leadership above them that are kind of casting the vision. You know, and so you go to the leaders and they're like, oh, no, that's not, you know, what they should be doing. Um, you know, what, it's hard to kind of get to the truth. So I was definitely feeling enclosed uh, in that organization. Um, and, and I was re ready um, and, uh, you know, ready to, to make a change. So that's, I think, for me, again, just such a significant moment in my life when I discovered Amazon kind of going through, through those feelings as well. Yeah, boy, I can uh, certainly identify with that. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize, and, and obviously the organization is, is big and successful and, and well-founded, but, you know, often uh, people don't leave jobs. The, the job itself is not the issue. It's they, they leave the managers and mm. they, they leave the, the culture because they just, they, they're just kind of done with it, right? They, it's like, you know what, I'm not making an impact. I, I have the right intention. I have the right uh, energy, but it's not making a difference. So why bother? And yeah. that's a good lesson for all of us who are building organizations to make sure we avoid that concept, right? Believe me, I've had companies where, you know, I've had cultural problems where, you know, the, the, the end employees felt like I was the biggest moron on the planet because I was letting some of these guys in the middle do things that were against our values or at least mm -hmm. had the perception that they were. So it's a big wake up call for anybody building an organization to build it in a way that makes people happy to be a part of it, not, uh, looking for the next gig. Well, and I'll, I'll just add to that. I think for me, kind of the, um, the, the real moment that struck me is I started to see that um, folks cared more about the organization than the individual. And so like a lot of decisions being made were kind of cover CYA, cover your own butt, um, you know, type decisions rather than making a harder decision that was better for the individual, you know, or better for the frontline staff. Um, and so, you know, that to me is kind of what started the dissatisfaction, I think, in my last organization, if that makes sense. It does. And this is actually quite a common scenario, uh, particularly it's a plague to middle management who has often the perception of, I just want to, I want to stay here, put in my time until I can become a big manager. Um, and, and often that means that they are more risk adverse. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes that means they they won't necessarily do the right thing. Of course, Osmers, we have this general philosophy that we would rather do the right thing now or not do something than do the wrong thing at any time. And yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. It's just, you know, it, it's a, a, an acquired taste, I suppose, uh, to some people. So uh, let me ask you this. Uh, as you look back, was there ever a day that you're like, oh, this was my best day? I remember this day or at least a, a great day that you was very noteworthy to you that stands out in your mind along your journey? Um, you know, I'll, I'll just keep going back to the day that 
I had worked for this organization for 15 years. And so when the day that I left that organization, um, I, I felt free. You know, I felt like I was finally doing something that I now had opportunity to grow. Um, and there was no ceiling. Uh, and so, you know, for me, it was just, it was just an extremely freeing feeling. You know, I don't want to use the, um, you know, the, the picture of like a prisoner leaving prison. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But you did. Yeah. But, yeah, but, but, you know, in a similar kind of way, because really now it was all on me. Uh, and so uh, that to me was, it's still one of the best days. It's, it's a very good uh, moment to kind of memorialize because too often, you know, we get caught up in the fear and the uncertainty and that kind of stuff. And we don't, we don't relish the, some of the freedom, some of the decision making we get to have. Whether or not those decisions work out, you know, positive or negative is a whole other coat of paint. Just our ability to make those decisions and to uh, exercise our own freedom. That's something really special. And I, I'm glad that you appreciated it in the way that you did. Mm. Uh, so I want to, I want to just ask you uh, before we kind of go to a break and talk about the future a little bit and some of the other things you're doing here in the present, is there a favorite tool or something that you use day to day? Maybe it's an app, maybe it's a, you know, something on your, your phone or anything that you care to share with the, uh, the awesomers out there? Sure. Uh, so, you know, my, my two favorite probably are um, Basecamp. Uh, that's one that we use for our agency. Uh, we just find the value there is, is terrific. Um, you know, I'm, so I'm in that on a daily basis. And then my second one may be a little unorthodox, uh, but it's Facebook. And uh, Facebook is, is what, was, what has allowed me to connect with people. Again, getting back to the relationship aspect. Uh, you know, I don't know how long it'll remain relevant, uh, but I know for right now, uh, it's been extremely beneficial uh, for me to be able to connect with individuals and to really be able to get into relationships. And so, you know, a lot of times uh, people will say, you know, Facebook friends are not real, <laughs> you know, or it's, it's not a real thing. But I, I can tell you from personal experience, I've been able to get into some really deep relationships with folks that I met on Facebook, I'll give you a, a real good example. Uh, we actually had a fire here at our home. We live in Hershey, Pennsylvania, uh, about three years ago. Um, and, uh, and somebody who I'd never met before on Facebook, you know, started a GoFundMe campaign. I didn't ask them. It was somebody I think I'd helped out on Amazon. And uh, within six days, they had raised over $15,000 you know, for my family and I, and it was all people on Facebook, the majority of them I had never met before. Uh, and so, you know, that's why, you know, some naysayers will come and they'll say, oh, Facebook, come on, that's not business. And, and I got to tell you, it, it's allowed me to get into some really good, deep relationships and it's really helped my business grow. I think it's a, it's a fair call out because uh, too many of us, and myself included, you know, I would say five years ago, I did not think of Facebook as a business tool. Four years ago, it became very clear to me that, you know, holy crap, this is actually far more interactive and far more engaging than LinkedIn, for example. LinkedIn mm -hmm. has a bunch of these uh, groups and forums and, and whatever they call them, but they're, they're really st very static and, and stale compared to the Facebook stuff, which can almost be like a live feed sometimes. Yes. And the, you know, for, uh, I don't spend a lot of my time taking pictures of the sandwiches that I eat each day. <laughs> uh, I'm mostly in it for the business, but it's really a remarkable tool. It's, it's a fair call. I'm glad you mentioned it because it's a surprising and counterintuitive uh, fact that it can be used so effectively for business, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's really, you know, here's the deal. It's where people are at. Yeah. And so, you know, as a business, you want to go where the people are at. Where are they spending their time? Uh, and, and, you know, honestly, for right now, folks probably age 30 and up, uh, they spend a good amount of their time uh, on Facebook. Yeah, boy, if we look at some of the stats, it's actually alarming. But <laughs> on, in fairness to uh, those stats, guys like Andy and myself, we may have that app on from time to time during the day, but it's actual business. We're, we're getting things done. We're, we're developing and, and fostering those relationships. I myself have had, I don't know, a half a dozen or more instant message chats today on Facebook where somebody asks a question or needs some resource and we're able to make those connections very quickly using these uh, technology tools. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan as well. So thank you for that. Uh, now that we've talked about a little bit about the background, we're going to come back, talk about the future and, and some of the things that Andy's doing day to day in his, in his current uh, life as well. We're going to do that right after this break. Empowering. 
The name says it all. Connecting e-commerce entrepreneurs with great people, ideas, systems, and the services needed to stay business dynamic and to grow. Empowery is a network, a cooperative venture of tools and resources to make you better at what you do. Because we love what you do. We are you. Visit Empowery.com to learn more. Okay, here we are. We're back again. Uh, Steve Simonson on the Awesomers.com podcast, joined by Andy Slammons. Still good? Yep. Woo, all right. Slam dunk. Yeah, I remember now. I got the, uh, I got the, the visual cue. Uh, so before we jump into the crystal ball and get your vision of the future, uh, tell us a little bit more about the, your, the agency that you and Leron are working on and some of the things that you guys offer to various Amazon sellers. I, I assume it's most applicable to Amazon sellers, but it, it may apply to other e-commerce people as well. I don't know. Yeah, it, it definitely more, it's more on Amazon. Uh, so uh, one of the first services we started was a image service. Uh, you know, when you um, put products on Amazon, you need to create some great images. And, you know, again, it was born out of our own pain points. You want to create lifestyle images with your products. And so, you know, you can have professional photography done. Uh, generally, you're going to pay about $700 to $1,000 uh, for those photographers. Uh, you know, they'll have models, lifestyle shots. And, uh, and, and that's a great way to go. But we saw that there was a, a big niche for folks that didn't necessarily want to pay that much, but still wanted lifestyle images for their photos. So we were able to connect with some um, graphic artists. We we're able just to take photos that people take with their iPhone. And so like, it, it is amazing what, what the work that they can do. So I, I actually just take pictures of my products with my iPhone send it to the graphic artists and they're able to Photoshop in some amazing lifestyle images as well as call outs. Uh, and they're just really able to make those images stand out for a, a, a bottom price of $129. Nice. So, uh, you know, it's really a great service and it's probably one of our most popular ones that we do. Yeah. So I definitely want to remind folks, especially if you have not sold online or on Amazon specifically, the images are, you know, really one of the most uh, defining parts of your, your conversion uh, metrics. If you don't have a good image, you're not going to grab their initial attention to get them to dive in and read more about it, uh, particularly when you have the images with the supporting marketing content. You can't have that on your main image in Amazon at, at this moment, but uh, on your subsequent images, you can have the little call outs, you know, here's, you know, what this is made of and it's now got this new protection or, you know, whatever the case is. Those can be highly effective. If you have a systemic solution for folks, I think it's a good thing that they know about it. Uh, yeah. Well, so, oh, it's going to just uh, go ahead. Carry on. I'll ask you. Yeah. So, so we do that. And then we do listing creation too. You know, again, it's a time thing. Uh, if folks, you know, want, want us to create their entire listing, we can do that. We can do the enhanced brand content. If you have brand registry 2.0, uh, you know, we'll do that as well. Uh, and then we do, we have a PPC management service. You know, if, if someone doesn't want to manage their own PPC, we can do that for them. Um, and, and then we have an Amazon account management service. So basically, um, Steve, you know that Amazon a lot of times will owe you money. Uh, maybe they've lost your product, shuffling it from warehouse to warehouse. And unless you know how to go in and open up those cases to get that money back, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, it's, it just, it takes time to do it. So we have a service that does that as well. That is such a, an important thing for those who have been selling on Amazon for a great deal of time, but are not keeping track of their, their case management. And there's all kinds of different cases uh, from the lost product to the customers who didn't return things. It's substantial amounts of money. And I know there's this urban legend running around that, oh gosh, if you file back on Amazon for the mistakes they made, they're going to cut you off at some point. But I can say unequivocally, I don't feel that way. And Amazon doesn't act that way. They do the right thing. They have terms of service. They, it works two ways. If they lose something or damage something, they're fine to pay you for it. They're not going to come after you. Um, I did have a case where they, uh, one time where they lost 22 pallets of mine, 22 <laughs> pallets. And, uh, and it was frustrating. And we were on that case. We were on the, uh, on the ball because we were looking for the stuff. Actually, <laughs> we were trying to ship some of that stuff to some big box stuff that we um, ran short on. And so we had them pack up these 22 pallets of material. And we got a tracking number, everything. But uh, as, as the case often is, the shipper never scanned that tracking number in. It, this was a, um, like a, a half a truckload of stuff. <laughs> and so we, we contact Amazon after the week or whatever. We're like, hey, where's our stuff? 
like, oh, you know, it's probably just, you know, in transit, who knows, sometimes they don't scan stuff all the time. So another week or two goes by, we're like, hey, where's our stuff? <laughs> and this goes on for about 12 weeks until it's like, okay, well, good news, Amazon. We've done the math. Here's the retail value of that product minus the Amazon fees. You owe us whatever it was, $160,000 or whatever. It's an expensive consumer product. Yep. And no, magically then, by the way, the 22 pallets showed up. Uh, <laughs> so at that point, uh, they found these pallets essentially just sitting near some dock door that never got loaded on and were just sitting around. But the investigators <laughs> over the 160 grand finally did figure it out. So, <laughs> But uh, to, to you know, just share my experience, for those who are not keeping track of that stuff, the smallest little things, customers not returning stuff, around... I don't know, 15 to 20% of those are not properly refunded by Amazon. That's Amazon's own guess, by the way. They think yeah. they're about 80 to 85% accurate. And so that means 15% of the time, potentially, maybe 20%, you're not getting refunded when the customer gets the money back but fails to return the product. And that can be a lot of money on, on mid-size to larger accounts, especially, but it's meaningful on any size account. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. Like? Absolutely. Well, do you have any... Uh, uh, fun wins or uh, examples you can share with us of, uh, you know, something you guys have been able to help facilitate in that front? Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, we, we have a number of sellers that do, you know, decent amount of volume. And, uh, you know, when they first sign on to the service, we'll begin to open up cases. They're all manually done. You cannot use a software to open up cases on Amazon. That's against Amazon's terms of service. So, so we actually have folks that go in and manually open it up, but yeah, we're talking thousands and thousands of dollars, um, you know, that these sellers are able to recoup immediately, you know, upon signing up to the service. So it, it, you definitely have to keep track of it. It's uh, such an important thing. This, this general concept of uh, management or auditing, however you want to think of it, is something that I really encourage um, entrepreneurs to think about. You know, if you do a significant volume of next day air shipping, for example, and you're not doing audits on those shipments, you'll find, again, somewhere between 12 and 18 percent of those shipments are showing up late. And if you paid guaranteed next day, and sometimes the contracts, by the way, FedEx and UPS will try to trick you into uh, not being able to get your rights. But if you have the right kind of contract, you can get all that money back. And we often would use agencies or facilitators to help us recover that because we had our own stuff to deal with. And so a specialist like you guys, I think could be helpful. Uh, is there any other signature type of service that you guys offer that you want to talk about? Uh, those are the three big ones, uh, okay. the image service, listing service, PPC management, and then Amazon account management. So four, those are the four main ones. There you go. Good. Uh, give me a, get out your crystal ball. And uh, recently mine went into the shop, so I can't really help you here, but I'm curious uh, what you think the Amazon marketplace or perhaps e-commerce at large will look like in five years. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think it's, it's just beginning. Uh, I think it is the rocket ship has just taken off. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you've had other guests on have probably said this as well. I believe e-commerce still is around 10% overall um, uh, when it comes to retail sales. Uh, and I think it's growing more and more every day. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if you're not in e-commerce yet, I, I, and if you have an interest in it, and now is a great time to learn about it, uh, to, to dive in. It's just going to continue to grow, and not only here in the U.S., but, but worldwide. So I think the growth worldwide is actually greater uh, than what it is in the U.S. When we were just at the Amazon Boost Conference, I believe they said worldwide growth was 20 to 30 percent year over year, um, you know, w which is incredible. Uh, and so, you know, logistics kind of rule the, rule the day. And, um, you know, getting in e-commerce now, you're really getting in just as the rocket ship's taking off. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Uh, so many people, as a matter of fact, I was sharing uh, recently that, uh, and maybe this is bad news for you, so buckle up. Uh, it's not going to be great news. But uh, I was reading on some Facebook forum posts where uh, they declared that private label selling was dead. Right? And uh, that you should just abandon Amazon and get off the uh, get off the ship uh, before it's too late. And of course, I chuckled and and asked them to go into the 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 reasons why they felt uh, selling on Amazon or private label selling was dead. And it, they gave all the the regular reasons. You know, it's uh, too many Chinese sellers. It's too hard. It's, you can't get reviews. 
you know, all, all the little uh, things that are just obstacles that need to be overcome. I, I'm curious what your reaction is to that uh, startling news and, and perhaps bad news for you that private label selling is over. <laughs> yeah. You know, what, what's the phrase? Uh, buy low, sell high, right? It's probably <laughs> been going on since the, the day of, of cavemen. And, um, and that will always happen. And, uh, and it's always going to be here. Uh, you know, what we need to do is we need to create great products that are quality, that, that meet the needs of customers. And so, you know, if, if you're relentless in that process, uh, Amazon is just an amazing opportunity, um, you know, for you to be able to place your product in front of millions of people almost immediately, you know, as you create that listing. Uh, and so, you know, there are really hundreds, I would say thousands of niches on Amazon right now uh, that if you dug into them, you would see high demand and a lot of times low quality product. And, you know, you can tell it's low quality by the average rating of the reviews. And so, you know, if you are diligent and you go in and you, you make your product better and it's work, I mean, you know that, right, Steve, it's hard work. Um, but if you're willing to put that kind of work in and you make a great product, your, 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 um, your product can really take off on Amazon. Uh, this is a, a fundamental thing we definitely agree on. Number one, it is work, everybody. If it was easy, anybody could do it. And this is not that. This is not a scratch lotto ticket. This is not, you know, uh, buy the cryptocurrency du jour and uh, have your money, you know, quintuple overnight. This is a business. This is building a brand and doing it in a thoughtful way. And, and I really appreciate Andy pointing out that you have to actually deliver value, right? He said it more than one time. If you don't deliver value, what good are you? Honestly, think about from the consumer perspective, how many of us go out and say, I want to reward this nice guy over in the corner who sells a crappy TV. No, you try to find the best TV you can find. You want to find what meets your requirements. We don't have any emotion tied up in it as consumers. We want what's best for us. And if we put our, ourselves in the position and maybe the shoes of the consumer, we're going to be better off because of it. Because those consumers, when they win with our product, our brand wins in the long run. Absolutely. Uh, so let, let me ask you this in, in the big picture. What, what do you think you're going to do with these brands as you build them? What, what's your uh, future plans for your brands? Yeah, so uh, I'm working on one right now. I'm super excited about it. I'm actually heading to China, the Canton Fair, uh, in October. Uh, so I'll be meeting with manufacturers there. Uh, and, and my partner, he's my nephew, his name is Nathan Slammons. We're working on a brand that, you know, our goal is that we're going to have it at $20 million a year within three years. Uh, and then within five to six years, we hope to have it at 50 million. Now, you know, to some folks listening, there might be like, man, that's a pipe dream. But, uh, but we kind of have the roadmap set out. And, uh, and we know that demand for, for the product and the niche is there. Uh, and right now, the products <laughs> that customers are buying um, are poor quality. And, uh, and again, that's why I love Amazon uh, buyers. I love the negative reviews because it really does show you exactly what you need to do to make your product better. Uh, and so, yeah, that's my long-term plan. We, you know, we hope that we, we hit 20 million in three and then we're at 50 million within five to six years. I love it. I think having a, a, a big, hairy, audacious goal or a BHAG as the uh, book Good to Great talks about is a, is a very important thing. Uh, myself, uh, I've been fortunate enough. We've, you know, done a zero to 50 million plus deal a number of times. It's That's quite awesome. doable. Uh, people just don't realize it. You know, this is one of the points of the Osmer's uh, uh, podcast is if your paradigm and your lens is always like, maybe I can get to a million dollars a year, then that's, that's the scope of your, your learning and that's the scope of your imagination. And I do remember uh, when we first started out, you know, we wondered, can we do a million dollars in a year? That seemed like the BHAG. That seemed like, wow, what a, what a moonshot that would be. <laughs> then we got to a million dollars in a year and we're like, wow, that is cool. And then we, we just thought to ourselves, I wonder, I wonder, could we ever get to a million in a month? What would that look like? <laughs> and the first time we hit a million a month, we were just like, whoa, that is extraordinary. That is crazy. Talk. <laughs> and, and as we would grow, then we said, you know, is it possible? can a guy do a million in a day? You know, is, is that, something that <laughs> and, and we gave it a go. Right. And, um, and we, you know, we, we had some good fortune along the way as well, but without breaking the paradigm and without 
you know, kind of eliminating those barriers, often self-imposed, we don't know where the, the opportunities are. And so I really do salute you guys for setting big, big, fat, hairy goals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're looking forward to it. We're having a fun time. And uh, we think it's absolutely doable. It is absolutely doable in so many ways. I, I, I assure you that. Uh, Andy, any final words of wisdom you may have for awesomers out there listening? You know, my, my, my um, really where I've been living, you know, the past probably year is, is in logistics. So if you are a physical product seller, I, I think logistics has become a more and more important. Um, you know, that just as you shared earlier, you, you really need to keep track of your numbers from an accounting perspective. Uh, I think in order to win in the physical product business in the next five to 10 years, you really need to have a streamlined logistics supply chain. Uh, and so, you know, what that looks like, you know, I've heard before um, Dick's Sporting Goods is like one of the best stores when it comes to their supply chain. So in my area, all the sporting goods stores have closed. Models, um, uh, Champs, all the major ones, you know, the only store that's still open, that's Dick's. <laughs> and I've heard it's because they have this sweet supply chain where they've really dialed it in and they only carry, you know, like three to five weeks of inventory. And so, you know, I think that as you grow your physical uh, product business, you really have to dial in your supply chain and have that baby as streamlined and humming as possible. Um, and that's really, I think, how you win the next five to 10 years. Boy, spoken like a great general. Uh, it, it really is true. Uh, many great generals have said, logistics win the war. And, and fundamentally, that is the truth in business as well. And it's actually getting more complex as we talk about cross-border trade, right? We talked about the opportunities globally. Uh, we talk about the complexity of China and tariffs and this and that. Uh, we can also talk about the, just the simple fact of cash flow. How am I going to pay for all this stuff, right, that's floating around? And when am I going to pay for it uh, as well? So all of these things are vitally important. And I hope the Osmers out there listening are paying close attention to Andy's words. Uh, Andy, we're going to uh, we'll get all the little links and everything for your, your uh, agency and your training and uh, podcasts and anything else we can get. And we'll throw those in the show notes because we want to be sure people know how to get to you. Uh, but I want to give you a big shout out and thank you very much for joining us today on Osmers.com. Thanks for having me on, Steve. I really appreciate it. Uh, certainly my pleasure. Uh, Osmers listening, uh, we'll be right back after this. Catalyst 88 was developed to help entrepreneurs achieve their short and long-term goals in e-commerce markets by utilizing the power of shared entrepreneurial wisdom. Entrepreneurship is nothing if not lessons to be learned. Learn from others. Learn from us. I guarantee that we will learn from you. Visit Catalyst88.com because your success is our success. A giddy up. What an amazing journey. I mean, Andy, what a, what a great guy and such an interesting background. And once again, this is another reason why I like to share these Osmer origin stories. You know, a lot of these conversations that, that I have with people are the same types of conversations that I would have if we were at a networking event, a mastermind event, you know, some kind of conference and we're just, uh, you know, at, at the bar or at the restaurant, you know, and we're just talking amongst ourselves. These same conversations are the types of things we would talk about, and it gives you a chance as the as the listener, the most valuable part of this program, to, to kind of get an inside peek behind the curtains. You know, all of us who are out there networking and masterminding and so forth, it, it takes a lot of time and lots of money, and you as the podcast listener get to kind of shortcut that. I call it a shortcut because you get to Put the podcast on whenever you want. You can listen as long as you want or as short as you need. And all of this is in your control. So I really, I'm a huge fan of not just Andy and the, the way his origin story lay down and, and what an awesome journey he's on, but also the fact that you are in control of this experience. And I'm just excited that you guys get a chance to, to hear such amazing stories. And it's really, really a, a rewarding concept for me to, to see and hear the reviews that are left on on Apple and, and some of these other review platforms. So thank you for those, by the way. Now, this has been awesomers.com episode number 45. And as I said, the secret is out. Just go to awesomers.com slash 45 to find all the show notes and relevant details and summaries and so forth that are relevant to this specific episode. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Awesomers podcast ready for the world. 
Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now's a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you could even leave a, a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guest, team, and all the other Awesomers involved at awesomers.com. Thank you again. Awesomers.com.